uh, Carrie Brand from uh, uh, Plantronics, who is in charge of innovation and new venture products, will tell us you know, how those new emerging uh, products will develop and, and will help us in this new way to work. And just, you get the mic. <laughs> All right, I've got the mic, so. Thank All right, well, good morning. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, the, uh, I'm the different one here. I'm the, uh, the guy that works for the wearable devices company. So, uh, you know, not necessarily communication infrastructure, but actual devices themselves. So, uh, just a quick poll. How many of you are familiar with, plant with Plantronics? Gosh, all right, that's just almost like, almost like Portugal. Okay, um, so I, I get the privilege of leading R&D uh, at Plantronics. So uh, we build a lot of body-worn devices. I get to play with sensors. My team you know, builds real devices. I'm a software engineer by background, so I get to actually help drive the integration of devices and software at Plantronics. It's really fun. I'm here today to talk about wearables. Uh, it seems to be an industry buzzword of sorts. And uh, so before, uh, you know, how many of you are familiar with wearables or at least heard the word wearables? Yeah. Fuel band, Fitbit, all that good stuff. All right on. Okay. Well, um, why do we think wearables are important? You know, we think that there's actually a potential for an industry to form around wearables. And as Plantronics, that perspective comes from looking at uh, trends that we've seen before. Um, so wearable technology in and of itself is, you know, it's not, it's not the Fitbit that's gonna make an industry. It's not the Nike Fuel Band that's gonna make an industry. It's actually the initial breakthrough of actually getting technology on the body and wearing it that is gonna start the form, to form the industry. And I'll, I'll kind of back that up with a little bit of history, you know. Uh, I think it's in 1866, that was the first time that the car was invented, I think that's correct. I think Mercedes invented the car. Yes? Ah, all right, there we go. So um, that car though, the initial invention of the car, that didn't lead to the automotive industry that we have, right? That's just a car. But the, if you look at the automotive industry and where it's at today, there's a lot of other pieces, a lot of other innovations that were built on top of that. Roads, fuels, electricity, or batteries now. But all, and laws, all of those things had to be put together to actually create the industry. So with wearables, what we're seeing is all of the, all of the right elements are in place. We see compute getting smaller and cheaper. Everyone here has probably got one or more smartphones on them. People are wearing their compute, and that compute is connected. So having that connectivity is also something that we're seeing. And these are kind of pillars that are going to prop up that, that industry, those, the, the innovations on which wearables will build upon. The other is um, mobility, so being able to move wherever you are with whatever device you're wearing and be connected. So it's, it's an exciting time. And for us, you know, oops, let me go this way. We, th we think wearables is kind of going to take advantage of those pillars. Okay. So where are we at today? You know, today, there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of devices out there. You know? If we think about this in maybe 10 years, there's going to be hundreds of billions of devices, not only connecting to the internet, but connecting with each other. And that's a lot. I mean, there's a lot of interesting things that can happen when you have that many devices talking to each other. Today, though, um, I've got a lot of devices. Um, you know, I, I'm sure you probably have got some of these in your homes or on your person. The problem that we see with devices like this today is that they're really good at doing one thing for you, right? Like my Fitbit is really good about being a Fitbit. It talks to itself. It talks to the app that's running on the phone, maybe but it doesn't talk to my headset, it doesn't talk to my fuel band, it doesn't talk to uh, my lumbar support uh, device that I may be wearing. These devices are kind of autonomous, right, in their, in their functionality, and they actually are creating um, kind of this, this kind of walled garden thing, right? So devices in and of themselves are great, but they're very fragmented right now. There's not a collective or a collection of devices that are working on your behalf. It's each device is individual, and it's doing its own thing. Um, the problem with that is that it doesn't really lead to an industry, right? If, these, if you have a lot of siloed pieces of data that can't really be uh, surfaced to actually help you out, that, that's kind of a problem. But there is hope, you know, this, these, these siloed, these walled gardens are going to be broken down. And the nice thing about that, and there, there are some technologies that can enable that uh, today. 
So this is why I'm optimistic that the industry is going to gel here within the next, I would, you know, it's starting to gel now. I think we're going to probably remove some of the fragmentation in the next three to five years. Um, but there, there, are, there are three technologies that are of interest uh, and will drive this breaking down of the walls. The first is ubiquitous connectivity. So um, assuming that most devices, especially ones in the room here, uh, that you're typing on or the ones that are in your pockets are connected to the web, right? Having ubiquitous connectivity is gonna be one of the drivers. And the reason for that is twofold. The first is when you have very small devices, they have very small batteries and they're not very powerful computers. They can do some things, but they can't do everything. So you need to be able to offload that compute. Now you can offload it to your mobile phone, that's one option, um, but for like the internet of things or to actually build really personalized experiences, you're gonna have to offload that compute to something much bigger. And I think cloud compute and virtualization, being able to spin up compute as you need it, is one of those key pillars. The second uh, fundamental piece besides ubiquitous connectivity is data analytics. So the devices that we build and the industry is building produce a lot of data. And, and your phone produces a lot of data. But there, unless you can interpret that data and do something with it, it's, it's just data, right? So analytics are very powerful, and companies use them today to improve worker productivity, enhance workflows, you know, find the bottlenecks and things. So analytics are, is very important. And what I foresee in the next you know, few years is that analytics will scale down not only for the largest of companies, but to the individual, right? So analytics will drive a very highly personalized experience. And the last piece of this is, and this, you know, you could replace this device with any, any device. Uh, this is just one of ours. But it's the wearable device itself and devices. And they're all kind of feeding into this ecosystem. So they have the connectivity. They have the ability to surface all that data to the cloud, the processing power to process all that data, and the analytics to actually make it very personal. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, OK. So what does that mean from like a device manufacturer and, and uh, you know, our perspective on things? So uh, this is a very simple equation. I'm not sure if it's, if it's gonna hold true, but yeah, this is, this is our thinking right now. As, as Plantronics and as a device manufacturer, when we speak at conferences, this is kind of the, the stack that we suggest a device manufacturer take when they're building wearable tech. There's actually the device itself, and that's, you know, that could be anything. Right? It could be on your ear, on your belt, whatever. But there's the wearable technology piece. There's smart sensing capability. And what that means is it's not about cramming as many sensors onto a piece of silicon as possible. Right? It's not about you know, having the most sensing capability. It's about building sensing capability that benefits the wearer, the user. So those two things have to go. It's comfortable device, smart sensing capability, and then the third is software because I can build a really great device. My team can really build some very, very cool devices, but if I can't surface that information out to a bigger system, it's useless. I mean, it may be very good for one use case on my body, but I think for the future of where we're going, it needs to be surfaced, and to do that, you need software. So software is a very important part of wearable technology. This stack creates something called context, and we talked a little bit about context yesterday, but it feeds into other contexts, so contexts like GPS information, location information from your phone, or from other devices. You know, the idea here is that you can take wearable technology, feed it into existing context, either external context, like this building, uh, or more personal context, like maybe temperature, or, uh, you know, uh, or, uh, or fitness level, and deliver some new enhanced experience. So this is kind of the, the, the equation as a wearable device manufacturer that we're trying to, to actually, we're trying to solve this. We're trying to help drive this. Um, all right. So what does that really mean, like really? You know, when you think about wearable devices, you know, what are some of the things that they can do? Um, well, the nice thing is, is that, you know, with, with mobile phones and, and laptops these days, there's a lot of radios on those devices, and you can actually inter integrate and interoperate with a lot of the mobile and, and desktop computing environments. Wearable technology can give you the context in between things. So a device can know things about you, very, very important things about you, like where you're at. Are you within proximity of things? Um, because the devices can actually read different radio signals coming from different devices, you can actually signal that information to an application. 
So proximity is, is easy to do. Um, it can establish identity. You know, we're, we've seen a lot of secure elements uh, being embedded into wearable technology. My iPhone's got one. I mean, I'm sure most phones have them. But being able to establish identity on behalf of the user is another thing that wearable technology can enable. And, and it can also tell you some other things, like you know, if you come into a room and there's a lot of peripherals, printers, screens, video systems, being able to get that information fed into something that could like coordinate a meeting, for example, is something where wearable technology could help. So it's kind of the glue that will enable some really good experiences. Oops, we'll go this way. So this is the, the wheel of sensing. Uh, this is what we talk about when we uh, are at conferences and uh, want to share some insights when you're building a wearable device. I'm not going to go through like every single thing here, but I'm going to skim over some of the stuff. And uh, you know, hopefully we'll have some time for, for questions after this. But you know, the, uh, the important pieces when, when you're building a device are you know, it's the sensors, the choice of sensors, and the algorithms behind the sensors. It's not just, again, as I said, putting a bunch of sensors on it in a piece of plastic and selling it. You have to actually write the algorithms that will, A, make good use of the power that you have, and B, uh, solve the use case for the user. So sensor selection is important. Applications become very important because usually these wearable devices have very limited or poor user interfaces. So integration with applications is something that has to be considered when you're designing these devices. And right now, I think any, any wearable that you buy on the market today has an application, right? It comes with an app. A Fitbit comes with an app. A Fuel Band comes with an app. Um, all of these uh, wearable devices have applications. But we're also seeing like Android and, and, I, and Apple create integrations, right? Apple's trying to actually get, trying to, trying to wrestle all of the wearable devices together with like its health application. Same with, uh, with Android, with, with Android L and its health application. They, they're trying to, to actually aggregate all of that data. So applications become very important with wearable devices. Privacy. So this one, if, if we're a standards, you know, if we're thinking about standards, this, this one I think is very interesting with wearable technology. Again, I could build a device today that could take your heart rate, could probably take your blood glucose level, could take any number of, let's just say, very personal data, okay? I could also build a device, that, the same device, that could actually take external data, you know, temperature, uh, humidity. Um, all of those things could actually be built, right? in one device. But where does that data go? Right? When, that, when, when that device connects and it's got my heart rate, it may have other vital information about me, where does that get published? Should it get published anywhere? And should it be published without my consent? So, just depends. So I think there's going to be some standardization around that privacy. I'd much rather, I, I don't have a problem broadcasting the weather. If my wearable device is saying it's really bright out, it must be sunny and there's no humidity so it's not raining. But uh, you know, if it's my heart rate or anything like that, I, I don't want that necessarily broadcast out. So we need to think about privacy. Power consumption is a problem with this industry. Uh, the more uh, powerful the device, the more connectivity it has, maybe Wi-Fi, for example, the more power it's going to drain. And when it drains power, that means you need a bigger battery, right? So the form factor varies. So when you're, when you're building wearable devices, you have to consider power and, and how you're going to be using it. And that really just depends on the use case. Again, from the, interoper from the standards perspective, interoperability is very important. Um, it's not there yet, and I, and I foresee it being, uh, our interoperability being either at the, the uh, mobile application, the mobile OS level, like uh, Android, iOS, being able to do the, uh, the interoperability for us, or it's gonna be in the cloud where uh, you're going to have all of this data published up to a cloud provider that's going to do the interoperability. It will do the integration between your fuel band and your Fitbit and your Plantronics headset. I think there's no one standard yet, and we're very fragmented as an industry with regards to machine-to-machine -machine interoperability. There's a lot of promise, but we're still very fragmented. But this is something, as, as an organization, when we think of a system, a communication system, that interoperability is going to become very important. So standards need to eventually evolve and become adopted. Uh, development platforms, software toolkits, 
every, I think every wearable should have a software toolkit that allows easy integration into whatever computing environment it needs to be in. Uh, in ergonomics, so I'll, I'll at, at, so at Plantronics, it's kind of interesting. So fit is very important with these, with these little pieces of wearable tech. It could be in your clothing, it could be on your belt, it could be on your ear. Um, at Plantronics, we take ergonomics a little crazy. We've got a, we, it's, it's very creepy. We have a wall of ears. Uh, we've actually taken casts from like uh, employees and customers that have had problems. And we've got this standard distribution of ears uh, in Santa Cruz. And uh, it's, uh, it's kind of disturbing, but it actually helps us fit our devices. But ergonomics is very important with, the wearable, with wearable tech. Um, and then connectivity. So mobile devices and, and desktop environments are starting to have more support for Bluetooth, Bluetooth, Bluetooth Smart, NFC, uh, and Wi-Fi, of course. But uh, for the small devices, it's going to be NFC, it's going to be Bluetooth Smart, likely as the radios of choice. And I'm not talking about home automation. I'm talking about just the body-worn stuff that's going to be talking to your phone. Okay. Um, and lastly is miniaturization. So just you know, upfront design, it's important. When you engineer a wearable device, miniaturization has to be put in first. OK, so that, I got through the wheel. Um, so that, all of those things together, you know, the cloud, the connect, you know, being able to connect to the cloud, the data analytics, uh, devices talking to each other, it's going to lead to this kind of new normal. Okay? And the new normal is going to be something where the wearable technology, I think, is just going to disappear into, your, into the fabric. It's going to be in your shirt. It may be a very discreet earpiece that is listening. But the idea here is that it works together, not just, you know, there, there's little machines talking to each other, and those little machines are talking to bigger machines. And there's communication that's happening, and it's all happening on your behalf. So an example of that would be, uh, you know, if I got up this morning, uh, and, uh, you know, maybe it's a couple years from now, but I put on my belt and my shoes, and maybe my belt's got a tension meter in it, right? So it knows how tight it is against my skin. Uh, my shoes may have pedometers built into them. Uh, I may have a mobile device that connects to the cloud. I may have something that's taking my heart rate, okay? That's, that's the stuff that's on my body. But in the cloud, I may have things about myself, like what I like to eat, who my friends are. Um, you know, my, my personal preferences may live up in the cloud. And then there may be the environment, the location. So I'm, in, I'm here at Microsoft, right? So like, there's all these like, little factors. But what's gonna happen is, is like when I walk out of the building here in a couple of years, I may say I'm hungry, okay? And I don't have to say, I don't have to push a button. I don't have to say, you know, hello Google or, you know, you know uh, hello Siri or whatever. It's just going to be, I've got a device on my person and I just say, I'm hungry. And that simple sentence will be parsed out in the cloud somewhere and an answer will come back, right? And it, will, it won't just be an answer that says, well, there's five restaurants near you, you know, which one would you like to go to? It'll be like, it'll be uh, something like, you know, I understand that you like pizza. Um, I understand also you went to Daniel's Broiler last night and ate a bunch because your belt is telling me so, right? I also understand that the shoes that you're wearing have told me that you haven't really walked very much today. You've walked from your car to this conference room and then out the door. Um, so what's gonna happen? It's gonna do that calculation. It's gonna say, you know, if you really like pizza, there's one, there's a restaurant that you could walk to. It's a 20 minute walk, right? And it'll calculate that out and it will guide me there. Right? But I didn't have to do anything on, on, on the, my behalf. I just had to ask the question. And all the technology around me, when it combines with the cloud, will work together to give me that answer. And it will guide me there. So this is kind of the new normal. Right? This is kind of where I think we're going. And I th I'm excited by it. And as far as like the industry impact, when we think of where wearable technology will have impacts, there's a bunch. The, 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 the health and wellness is very much low-hanging fruit. You know, we've seen lots of fitness devices out there, fitness trackers, this quantified self. So this, you know, that's kind of where it's going to start. But I think there's opportunities for wearable technology to integrate into many environments. From the infotainment uh, environment, you could have wearable technology that's listening to heart rate information or breathing cadence. Feed that into a video game, and your video game experience could adapt based on if you're sweating or if your heart rate is accelerating or maybe if you're just showing signs of being bored, maybe the game becomes more exciting, but you could take all of the con context that you're generating as a, as a player, feed that into the game and have a better experience. From the healthcare and wellness side, I look at it 
you know, I, I look at it from a uh, doctors and nurses is one type of vertical, but I look at it from like my, my dad. You know, my dad, he lives by himself. Uh, he's getting up there a little bit in age. Um, I wish that I could have some technology that could allow me not to monitor him, but just to let me know when he falls out of normal patterns, right? I'd like to be able to have maybe a device that he's wearing or his environment tell me, you know, your dad over time usually gets out of bed at nine o'clock. It's 10.30 and I still sense that he's in the bed. You know, maybe you should give him a phone call. Those kinds of use cases I think are, are, are where wearable technology can have significant impact. It can let people age gracefully in, home, in their own home. And you know, that's, that's what I'm shooting for when, when we're building stuff is, you know, how, can, how can this benefit you know, not only our customers, but you know, like my dad, I, I think about that. Um, business and office, we can see wearable technology helping to orchestrate meetings, uh, procure resources, track resources, all of these, you know, track people in the building so you can find somebody when you need them. So wearable technology has definite, uh, uh, you know, will have benefits in, in the office. And then from the communications perspective, uh, you know, we build devices that obviously plug into all, you know, most communication systems. Uh, there's going to be a strong audio component to wearable tech. It's going to be driven. I think that's going to be the interface for wearable, wearable technology is an audio interface. Um, and I think that is all I have. So, any, uh, any questions? Yes, Keith. Carrie, that was a great presentation. Uh, on the wheel, you talked in some of the areas uh, where, standards were, uh, where standards were needed. Yep. Um, where, where does that standardization activity normally take place? Is it lots of different groups or? Yeah, I think there's some consortiums that are developing around machine-to-machine -machine standards. So where do the standards take place? You know, there, there's several out there today. You know, there's, there's folks, uh, Cisco's got some that they've joined. There's some that IBM have. Um, there's like the All Join Alliance, which is another one that's sponsored by, I think, the Linux Foundation. So there's a lot of consortiums that are developing trying to solve the problem. But there's no mass adoption by uh, the device manufacturers yet as to which one's going to win. So. I, st I think we're still very fragmented. Okay, and, and in, um, in addition to, say, the connectivity standards, like you mentioned Wi-Fi a lot, and, yeah. you know, uh, um, it, are there, you know, are, on that wheel, is everything kind of proprietary there, or is it, are there other areas that are far along in standardized, in standardized approaches? Um, I think there's, there's things on that wheel that, are, that should be open and standardized. I, I think the, from a wearable device perspective, the secret sauce should be in the firmware algorithms that are being written to actually make the device highly usable. Uh, it's not about, I mean, you know, uh, I, I would have no qualms about publishing our machine to machine API and just let people see all the bytes. I don't care, right? What I care about is how those bytes are generated. So, yep. yep. There was one? another question over there. Not having a lot of overlap, um, with the exception of all seen and thread, or basically, but thread's more of a, an approval process for already using the Google stuff. But um, some of them are focused at the machine to machine of um, the Google one in particular, and all joins seem to be focused on the devices talking to each other inside the home, not flowing out over the internet back to each other. Right. And um, some of the other ones, the Intel. Um, there's one, there's one are basically the same, the Internet Alliance or something like that. There's an Intel one. There's another M2M one that is more at the architectural level. It's like the telemanagement forum version for IoT, where they provide blueprints and architecture. And then the Intel one uh, is more at the M2M level of um, how they're going to standardize those transactions. So, All right. Another question? Yes. But no one wants to pay for it. <laughs> yeah, with healthcare, uh, so we're we're starting to see some some devices that are getting FDA approval for like monitoring heart rate and stuff. Uh, for when when I look at healthcare, um, one of the things I mean, I'm speaking as 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 Plantronics now. I'm not speaking as as me. But uh, the barriers to building devices that are FDA approved are are big, right? And they take a long time. And technology is moving very quickly. So. You've got to place your bets, and you may build a device that's FDA approved but antiquated, right? So, it's 
I, I look at it more from the sense of how can we augment what's there without needing FDA approval, right? Yeah, uh, so, so the biggest barrier we've seen in healthcare in this area is if you produce all this information from patients or anyone living at home and you don't do anything with it, then the physician becomes liable as well. Right. There, is, there is a flip side of, great, you have all this information, you should have known this person didn't wake up at 10 o'clock, something bad happened. Yep, and, and that's also, And then what? <laughs> well, that's the other thing. There, there's the flip side of that. So the uh, doctors don't, so one of the things when you go into a, like a, like a uh, go visit your doctor and let's say that you've got four devices on you that are feeding in vital information to the doctor. What happens if you go in and your doctor doesn't, or per, hasn't read it yet? How do you feel, right? It's like, wait, you don't, you don't care about me, you know, right? But doctors will become inundated with lots of data. So yes, I agree. There, there are some barriers that need to be, to be worked through. All right. Thank you, Carrie. Cool. Thank you. Very interesting.